our uh, staff, uh, myself particularly, I'm a member of uh, CES, which is Center for Educational Safety through the Missouri School Board Association. I'm also a member of RSOC, which is the Regional Homeland Security Oversight Committee, uh, certified ALICE instructor, and then also a certified school safety specialist, where we have three other individuals in our district that hold that certification as well. We have district staff that help develop the curriculum for the Missouri Certified School Safety Specialist Program. We also have staff, uh, myself and Ms. Keyes, who help develop the Missouri model for the behavioral risk assessment uh, process. And we'll do a deeper dive in that tool that we utilize in our district uh, a little bit later on. And then uh, also a uh, statewide trainer for the Missouri BRAT model, which also uh, we present regionally and nationally as well from Virginia, Colorado, Texas, uh, Minnesota, so on and so forth. Uh, we also have district personnel, such as our school resource officers, who are now employed by the uh, school district, and they are still commissioned, though, through the Cape Girardeau Police Department. We are currently at five SROs that are dispersed out throughout our district, and uh, we currently uh, have a sixth position that we're screening for, so we're adding to that. Some of our various protocols that we have, uh, we have emergency go bags deployed throughout uh, our entire district and all of our classrooms. These are for any type of uh, intruder situation or a natural disaster, whether it be a tornado, earthquake, um, you know, anything like that or an active intruder. We have controlled access. We utilize various different electronic uh, platforms as well too, such as Kid Account. If you're a parent of an elementary student, uh, you have to present an ID to actually pick up your kid. So we ensure that the correct kid goes with the correct family at dismissal of the school day. And we also have a rostering system with that. And we further have a visitor check-in and check-out uh, management system. So that does a, an instant background screen um, against various federal databases. So if somebody should not be permitted into the buildings, uh, it catches them there. Or if we have a non-custodial parent that tries to come in and uh, pick up a kid, it catches that. We have door barricades throughout. Uh, we use video uh, camera systems. We have begun utilizing more widespreadly this year weapons detection systems. We had already had those in place last school year. I um, mean, we had seen the success uh, that those systems had done, and we decided to push them out even more so. So this school year, uh, we pushed them into other buildings and as well as other extracurricular uh, activities. We have vape detection systems. Uh, those also dual as decibel detection systems. So if there is a sharp increase in decibels, uh, it sends an alert to certain staff in the building that, hey, in this area, the conversation level went from uh, a certain level to a uh, higher level, and we know something's probably going on. We have behavioral risk assessment teams for each building. Uh, we have over 70 staff members trained on how to assess kids and determine whether or not there's behaviors that they are uh, showing, uh, whether or not they are posing a threat, or if it is something just more visceral, or maybe it was just a mistake or a poor choice in, in the behavior that they displayed. We use a multidisciplinary team approach where we have administrators, nurses, counselors, psych examiners, uh, various other staff members, uh, maybe they have a special lead with uh, special needs students uh, where they have gone through the process of learning how to assess those kids to determine if they're on a pathway to violence. And then by determining what level they are at, we then look at various safeguards and we look at case management um, if we're able to hopefully de-escalate them on what's called a pathway to violence. Now. Along with the risk assessment process, we also have a legal process that may intertwine with that, as well as a discipline process as well, too. But our goal of the risk assessment process is to truly see if there is a threat that has been uh, that is being posed by that individual. The background work of the risk assessment model is based off of. I'll get to that. The, the basis of the risk assessment model is developed off the U.S. Secret Service. Uh, we work closely with them. Uh, we have a relationship with their St. Louis office, as well as the Eastern and Western FBI offices with their behavioral analysis unit as well, too. But as Ms. Keyes um, 
rightly said so, that's only part of the equation. The other part of this comes to the case management of the student and how we support those students if we find them on the continuum and we find them on the pathway. So multiple different protocols, I'm not gonna go into detail on that, on that right now, but I can talk to that later on what interventions we can put in place to help support that student and not just the student, but the family as well, because it's not just a one-step solution. Every kid is different and every family is different. We utilize Crisis Go. Uh, it is a panic uh, platform and it allows a panic button on every staff member's cell phone, iPad, laptop, desktop computer. Uh, it also has a reunification system that goes along with that. So in the event that there is an emergency, how do we get uh, our students and our staff back to their families? We utilize radio and walkie talkie systems, including GPS monitoring on the buses. Uh, we can even drill down and see how fast a bus was driving. Uh, we can actually see in real time if it made the bus stop or not. Um, and it also has emergency beacons on there. So if there is a emergency that happens on the bus, we can deploy that beacon and it alerts us within our district and we can deploy our SROs or call other law enforcement agencies for help. We have multiple layers of cybersecurity programs, uh, filters, uh, so we monitor uh, the electronic devices of what's going on. So if there's an unsafe search that is taking place, or if there is threatening or bullying behavior that we see that is taking place on our electronic devices, we can get in early and intervene on behalf. Uh, we also use uh, yonder pouches, and this is our second year uh, utilizing those at the high school, but we have rolled those out to the junior high as well too. And that limits the access to cell phones that our students have, and that is a, uh, the basis was to re-engage on learning, and that has uh, tremendously improved um, the amount of face-to-face -face time and kids actually being in contact with one another instead of being buried on their phones uh, has greatly increased. We have various internal preventative measures as well, too. Our staff annually undergo CPR, first aid, AED uh, certification. We also roll out Stop the Bleed training at times. Uh, we offer CERT training available to our staff and our students. We're one of the few high schools in the area that actually will allow our students to go through CERT training. And that is the Community Emergency Response Training. So in the event, again, of a natural disaster uh, our, or a man-made disaster, our staff and our students would know how to react. We complete numerous safety drills uh, every school year, uh, fire, earthquake, intruder, tornado. And we also have ongoing staff professional development. We have staff access to a library of safety resources through a Google, a Google Drive uh, platform, uh, social media, drug abuse, how to identify various different drugs, uh, natural disasters, various trainings, emergency resources, and our staff can also push out that literature uh, to families to help support them, but we can also uh, utilize that training in the greater community. So many times I've had other staff members come up, especially when our community started seeing such drugs as fentanyl come in several years ago, or even xylazine just a few, uh, about two years ago, what it looked like, what it does, how to counteract it, so on and so forth. We utilize suicide prevention teams, plans and procedures. We have district safety team, and we maintain and update building uh, EOPs for the district and every staff member has access to our EOPs at a touch of the button through the Crisis Go app. Those EOPs are also shared with our local first responder agencies as well, and a Google mapping system for first responders. And the way that operates is we developed it in-house, where if we have a call that goes out of a certain classroom, maybe just coming to the front doors isn't the closest place to respond to that. Let's say if we have a student who may be uh, suffering from a seizure, and we need to get first aid into that kid as quickly as possible. It'll show where to actually show up on the building as quickly as possible to be able to get to that specific room. So they're not having to run around a maze, per se, to get where they need to be. Next, uh, we have other internal preventive measures by Ms. Keys. So Josh spoke about all the security measures that we have in place. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have in place to support our students. We talked about the behavior risk assessment model. With that comes a response management plan. So what we do is we work to make sure that whatever level of risk that student is at, we are providing supports that match their needs, not just their needs, but the needs of the family and then also the needs of the school. Like how are we going to make people in the school feel safe based on what may or may not have happened with this student? 
So in order to support all of those things, we do um, have a district mental health support counselor. She is hired by the district. Um, so she provides counseling services with no cost to the family, no insurance. We don't look at that. It's a one-stop signature for a parent and they can get services. Obviously she has a limit to what she can serve. So I wish all of our counseling services were one stop, one signature, but that's unfortunately not the case. But Teresa is incredible. She works with many of our students and families and her caseload is always full. As soon as one goes off, another comes on. We also partner with Community Counseling Center. We have a great relationship with them. They have provided us with three school-based therapists and a crisis therapist that work with us only full time. Um, and we also have wait lists for them. We also have a memorandum of understanding with Great Oak Counseling and they work with our district at a reduced rate um, to serve our students. And then we have a program called Care to Learn um, through the district. It's a nonprofit that we manage through the district, but we are able to pay for students who do have private insurance. We can pay for up to six sessions for that student at the reduced rate through Great Oak if they have private insurance. Because if you don't receive counseling services, you may not know this, but counseling services with private insurance typically cost anywhere from $125 to $175 a session. So that's not reasonable for anybody, much less a middle-class family who is barely getting by. So um, after those six sessions, if we feel like a student needs more from our response management plan or from um, just the input of our staff, we revisit that and we can provide more for that student if necessary. We also partner with Big Brothers Big Sisters and ABC Today. They provide mentoring uh, in our school district. So we have female mentors and male mentors that work with a group of students right now at the middle school, junior high and high school levels. We're always hoping to expand in those areas. Um, they also work with a small group of students that they, they go through each grade with so that they stay connected. We also run other groups within the district. Um, we have a girls group at the junior high. We have Tiger Lilies. Um, the girls group is called IF, which is Intelligent Females, I think is what that stands for. The one at the middle school is Tiger Lilies. And then the one at the high school doesn't have a fancy name right now, it's girls group. Um, but she does see a couple of groups out there as well. Young Women of Excellence, yeah. Young Women of Excellence is the mentor program, yes. Um, thank you. And then the District Mental Health Support Counselor, she also runs programming at Central Academy. She has several groups running there. Juvenile runs at least one program I know for boys at Central Academy, and I think they're looking at potentially expanding that. And we are working with other outside agencies to come in and really start working on um, social emotional skills regulation, how to regulate yourself when you do feel upset and how your first response in when you hit, get that fight or flight mode doesn't have to be fight. Um, so that's something we're really, really trying to hit heavy right now. And we're working with various community agencies to try to bring more staff in to help support that. Community Counseling Center is always open to supporting us with those things as well. It's just that there's a little more strings with it on when it comes to group therapy. Uh, in our elementary schools, we use Boys Town Social Skills so that we are using a common language across our schools. So a basic one, just because it's the most basic one that we teach at the beginning of the year is look, say, do. So when you're given a direction by an adult, you look at the person, you say, okay, and you do what you've been asked right away. Obviously, of course, as long as that action isn't going to harm you or harm somebody else. So that's just one example. We have um, social skills for literally everything under the sun um, that we help teach our students and we try to keep them very concise. And that way, if a student does, because we do have a lot of students that are transient between different schools in our um, district, they will hear this same language. When they go into middle school, if they have grown up in our district, they will come in with the same language base and the same understanding of those skills. That doesn't mean that they have learned to regulate themselves. That means that they have learned the skills and what they should be. So for those who have heard the skills but cannot yet apply the skills, that's where we're focusing on digging deeper and doing some of the group and mentoring that we've talked about. We are also a district that's focused on implementing trauma-informed practices. So we always wanna be very aware of what has happened to a student. The first question when they act out um, in a physical or other unusual manner isn't always, why did you do that? It's, can you tell me what happened before you came to school today? Did you eat last night? When's the last time you ate? How are you feeling? Uh, you know, um, those kinds of things. Are your basic needs met? So we try to focus on that first. If if there's a no anywhere in there, which almost always there is, then we start to address that basic need as we work to um, educate the student on other ways to respond. And then we also use restorative justice and restorative practices, just as Juvenile talked about. 
Um, the one thing that I want to be very clear on, because people get confused about this with restorative practices, is restorative practices is aligned with consequences. One does not exist without the other. So sometimes people will think, well, you're just talking about restorative practices. You want to just get people in a room and everybody say you're sorry and go on. Yeah, that's what we want to do. But in doing that, we want to educate them on how should I respond next time. And they're also going to have a consequence for whatever behavior occurred. The reason that that is important is because that's what happens in real life. We don't just get to say we're sorry and nothing happens if we have actually physically harmed somebody, especially when you turn 18. So if you're 18 and you punch somebody in the face, the wrong person, which we had an altercation recently where somebody thought it was somebody and punched them and it was actually the wrong person, that's called an assault, right? When you turn 18, that's an assault. You're going to do time or be charged or whatever. Um, so in the school system, we don't just want to say, hey, you know, Johnny and Howard, um, y'all need to come in and we're going to work with you on what went on here. Where was the miscommunication? How can we work past this? What does this look like moving forward? How can you guys stay apart if you're not ready to um, reconcile? And what kind of skills can we work on so this doesn't happen in the future? And by the way, you did hurt somebody and a school rule is you cannot physically hurt somebody because you did. You're going to have a suspension for this amount of time. These are the supports that we're going to put in place for you so that you, we can help you make better choices in the future. But everything is aligned. Um, we also use CPI, so we train all of our staff in nonviolent crisis prevention intervention. That's an annual requirement now. It used to be every three years, then it went to every two years, now it's one year. So we are all trained in how to de-escalate a situation verbally is our hope first. Um, if a student ever is uh, about to harm another student or is harming another student or is currently harming themselves, then we are trained in restraint methods that do not harm the student and do not harm us when done correctly. So we also have that in our back pocket. Then we also utilize care teams. So care teams are um, can be used for academics, they can be used for behavior, anywhere where a student is struggling. So if a teacher comes to us and says, hey, I'm going to focus on behavior today because that's what down the, down the line leads to potentially violence in the community. You know, I, Johnny is very disrespectful in the classroom. I cannot get him to follow through with a task or struggling with compliance and getting along with others. We can start a, a team where we're going to start talking about Johnny very specifically. We're going to get that parent in there and have conversations with the parent, or we're going to do a home visit if we can't get him in there. Um, and if we can't reach the parent for any reason, we're still going to take it on and we're going to figure it out together. How are we going to support this student so that they can make process, progress behaviorally in the school setting so that we are reducing the, op the chances that they may act out in a violent manner? So we start that as young as kindergarten level. Um, we also, I skipped over this with Community Counseling Center, along with the school-based and the crisis, we have a program called Day Treatment that is um, a program that is Cape Schools and Community Counseling Center together. We provide the teachers for that program, so they get half a day of schooling and then half a day of therapy. Therapy piece is provided by Community Counseling. So the Community Counseling piece, um, they do group therapy and individual therapy. They also do family therapy. They have a caseworker. Um, they're constantly working as a unit together. We all are to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to make the student successful. The goal is always to get the kid back in school as quickly as possible. So then we start to transfer them back into the public school setting at an hour a day, up to three hours a day, and eventually to a full day. They also have access to a residential treatment program. We do not determine who goes into residential treatment. That is completely a medically, um, a medical-based program, but we do have access to that and we do have students who utilize that if necessary. Uh, and then also Community Counseling Center provides us with substance abuse programming. So a few years back, uh, we came together as a cabinet and we were talking about kids that were using drugs, getting out of school suspended for long periods of time. Guess what they're doing when they're out of school suspended? Drugs. And so that was not effective, right? So we came to the decision as a group and through a lot of research, research-based um, decisions, that we really needed to provide our students with some type of substance abuse counseling because it wasn't enough for us to say, hey, you need to go access substance abuse counseling because most of them aren't going to do it. They can't afford it. They don't know where to go. And even if we give them the phone number, the place and the time may not have transportation to get there. So we brought it in. Community Counseling Center agreed to that. They brought it in. They provide it on our campuses. We have it on campus at the high school. 
um, and Central Academy where students can come and um, they do four sessions right now. There's always room if we get to the end of the four sessions and the counselor thinks this did not go anywhere with Howard, um, then he shouldn't have stood by me. He's, you know, um, then we have other options for that. But that has been a tremendous uh, piece that we could bring together with the community and the students so that they can just learn about what do drugs do to your brain? Because telling them just don't do drugs isn't effective anymore, right? They're already doing them. They already know what it feels like. So we have to take a different approach and we have to say, this is what it's doing to your brain and your ability to function in the future. And we're hoping that some of that sticks. All right. Um, space bar yeah. or next. Okay, other preventative measures. And we're giving you a lot of preventative measures because we feel that the value is in the front load of it. We would much rather be proactive than reactive. So we also conduct uh, monthly campus safety security meetings. These various state agencies, uh, DFS, DYS, probation, parole, juvenile, uh, community counseling can be represented there. Our HIBL, uh, which is a youth behavioral health liaison for the area, will come in. But we also have representatives from KIT PD, uh, Jackson PD, uh, public, private, parochial schools uh, are represented. Um, schools as far away as Oak Ridge come in and represent too. And we talk about various things that are affecting our school and our school communities. In, have those deeper conversations about what are we seeing? How are you combating it? Where can we go from here and continue to network? The partnerships that Mandy had already talked about uh, are listed there as well too. And then we have also been the recipient of just north of $500,000. Uh, I should say in the last five years, not four years, I apologize for that, through various grants, uh, the Department of Justice Stop Violence grants and other uh, community violence prevention grants. Uh, and we have implemented those into uh, protocols and also direct purchases of safety uh, apparatuses. Howard? I guess I'll be the last one. I'll use you as an example, Mandy, <laughs> uh, since she uh, used me for so many great examples. Uh, we just have so many different uh, support systems. We've already talked to you about a lot of those things that are going on in our school district. It's a lot to juggle, and we have a lot of people that are part of that. Some of them are in this room now. Uh, we appreciate our leaders that are here and our board member that's here as well. Uh, one of the things that we do have in, uh, in our district is our Kate Central Academy. So if a student is struggling, it's really an alternative learning environment. Sometimes people think, uh, our academy as only behavior kids go there. It's just not for kids that have severe behaviors or those types of things. We also use it for catching up with credit because we have students that are not uh, meeting their potential and getting their credits for credit recovery because we want to see all of our students succeed and we want to see them um, graduate from high school. <clears throat> it allows for us to have a smaller class size and then it just, gives you an accelerated opportunity for credits for our high school students. And a lot of times we'll have kids come to uh, the Central Academy to actually catch up on their credits, basically a credit recovery program. Another one that we have, we've had in place for probably four or five years now is Cub Club. This is for our little ones. Uh, we had to have an opportunity so our kids are not watching themselves at home. So we offered this program, it's an after school care program. Uh, they provide homework help, after school programming and different types of activities like art, music, different crafts. They have guest speakers. They go to the swimming pool and swim. Uh, they do a variety of things. I, I can't even tell you the, the, the amount of things, but we also have scouting in there as well for free for all of our students. So any student that wants to participate in scouting, they can uh, um, attend that scouting program that we have in our schools. We have Missouri Options. Uh, Missouri Options is another alternative for students that are behind in their credits. They have to be a certain amount behind in their credits. Nancy, you know how many credits they have to have before they can go in? Yeah, off track for grad. Yeah, so, they, so once they're 17, they can go into this uh, Mo Options program where they can actually take their high set assessment and, and, and receive their diploma. Um, so it, it's a great opportunity for a student that may be working 
and really needs to support their family, they can actually go through this program a half a day. Uh, we'll help them get through some of the courses to be able to pass that high set test, and then they can earn their diploma as well. So there's lots of opportunities for that for our kids. Um, we have an AEL program for those students that have dropped out of school or are over the age of 18. It's an adult literacy program, adult educational literacy program. It basically individualizes plans for those uh, students, I call them students, they're adult students, so that they can actually get their GED. We have a transition program that is connected to our Cape Central Academy. If students are not able to really uh, function in a full day program, we have a half day program. Uh, some of it's because of behaviors, some of it's because it's just too overwhelming for them. So we uh, have an opportunity for them to attend a half day program. Uh, we have positive pathways. One of the things we talked about when we suspend a student uh, for a drug infraction, we actually can put them in the positive pathways, which is an ISS, which is in school, but they're not in the on the campus that they may have had some problems with and they can do their counseling or their drug counseling services uh, there as well. And then once they complete those drug counseling services and we feel that they are capable of going back in the classroom, we can reduce those suspensions. And we try to do that as, a, as a, an incentive to make sure that you're really following some of those drug counseling programs that they're put in place. They'll tell us whether they're, they're gonna be able to make it or not. So for them to participate in that drug program is one thing but to get something from it is another. And so if we feel that they're getting something from that drug program, we'll be able to reduce their uh, in-school suspension. We have virtual learning, which is just another alternative. If a student does, isn't successful in the buildings, sometimes we have students that have high anxiety but do very well. Uh, in their in their academics, uh, they can they can uh, be placed on virtual learning. The state also has a virtual learning platform too. But if it, they're on our platform, we can check in with them. Ms. Legrand is our uh, our virtual learning uh, teacher. She assigns ingenuity to these students, and then she can do checkups with them to make sure they're staying on task and and they're they're completing their work. Mm -hmm. even though they're on virtual, we yeah. can connect with them and their program. Yeah, yeah. And then also, if we need to provide uh, special ed services and those type of things, we can also do that as well. Uh, we have partial schedules, students who just need an, another alternative option. So if we have a, a student that's struggling maybe with their behaviors and we need to place them on a half day or a two hour day, we can do that. And then they can work back their time as they uh, be able to control their behaviors and, and some other stuff as well. Uh, we do that as well. We have uh, extracurricular stuff. As we know, the more kids are engaged in school, this is a very important piece to what we do as a district. The more kids are engaged in their buildings, the better off they are and, and the, the better their behavior the more engaged they are in learning. So we wanna to try to provide as many extracurricular activities as we can from the district. So we try to let them be a part of who the district, who we are as a district. So just some of those things, one of our big ones that we've been doing for the last three years, you're probably familiar with it, is our youth sports program, which is a partnership with the city, which is probably one of our most powerful programs, especially for our K-6 uh, student, students. So we really uh, love that program. We're continuing to expand that. Uh, it gives our parents an opportunity to participate their kids to participate in sports for free. And we pay for that and it's a partnership with the city as well. And it's such a powerful program. We have athletic programs, 712, we have band, we have orchestra, we have drama. There's, I can't even list all of the great things that are going on in every building. Um, just know that, that if there's something, if a kid cannot be, a student can't be engaged in our school, they don't wanna be engaged. And so we have to figure out how to get them more engaged. And that's what we try to do through our connectedness surveys and the upper grades and, and things like that. The connectedness survey is we send out surveys to our students and those students uh, kind of tell us who they're connected to in the school. So if a student is struggling, we can send that teacher or staff member to them and say, hey, is there something that we can do to help you? How can we can help you get engaged in our, uh, in our district? Mm -hmm. And then who is my trusted adult in the community? 
And if they can't name one in either of those places, then we try to connect them with them. one. If they do name one, then that's the person we want engaging with them when they're upset or when they're struggling. And, and a lot of that is done through the care team. So for instance, at the high school, it, when Ms. Scheller does her care teams, they're trying to identify who can get with that student if they're struggling in academics or if they're struggling in maybe in behavior or they're just not engaged or not coming to school. Uh, she can connect, she can look at that survey and really connect someone to reach out to those kids to make sure that they're here um, and engaged. We have a 21st century grant that we wrote last year, year before last, and it was approved. It's $2.5 million that we can provide services and after school programming for sixth through 12th grade. I'm, I'm sorry, fifth through 12th grade. It is an unbelievable grant. There's so many things going on. I can't even list. I'm gonna tell you some of them, some of them, but not all of them because there's a lot, a lot of programming for fifth through 12th grade. Uh, just, um, it gives the opportunities for those uh, fifth through 12th graders to not be at home and be in the school setting. We also provide transportation uh, home as well with that grant. Uh, we do after school tutoring. So if a student is struggling academically, uh, we have after, uh, after school tutoring and before school tutoring even at the high school level because sometimes kids can't participate in that because they're in some type of athletic, they're struggling in academics. So they have it in the morning as well. Um, uh, we have life skills, cooking, robotics, running, uh, weightlifting club, dance, esports, coding. I could list a lot. There's a lot, a lot of things going on. Uh, some things that I don't really understand. There's a gaming club. I think I don't really, I don't know, really understand that one. It's they they play games, you know, board games. So I don't. But they have a good time, and there's quite a few kids that are that are participating in that one. I guess they're very competitive in the board game. Um, we have, like I said earlier, we have scouting. Uh, they serve five elementary schools and every student that's in that kids club or after kids club, a cub club, they get it for free. So every student gets uh, scouting for free if they attend a uh, cub club. Uh, let's see, we have also with scouting, we have the Explorer program. We just started that this year through our JAG program at the alternative school. So our, our JAG program is Jobs for America graduates. It's something that the governor uh, really uh, pushed the last two or three years. We've had it in our, in our school district for three years now. And it is such a powerful program for our kids because our kids that are in our alternative school program don't always know what direction or pathway they wanna go. So this is just going to enhance it through the scouting program, it's called Explorers. And so they're gonna come into the programming and actually reach out to community members and community businesses and find opportunities for them to uh, shadow. So these kids can start seeing what's going on at the hospital, what's going on at Mondi, what's going on at P&G. We have different partnerships that they're gonna work with and, and our scouting program is going to do that through Explorers. So we're really excited about that because um, it gives those kids a vision, a path of, hey, I can do this, I can finish this, and this is the direction I wanna go. So we wanna make sure that, that we can continue to do that. We're starting that this year. We're really excited about that. Mentoring, we talked about big brothers, big sisters. Unbelievable. I wish Ashley was here. She could really truly tell you some of the great things and, and, and the great successes that have happened from our big brothers, big uh, program. We started our, uh, our boys group, our men's group at the junior high first, uh, probably three years ago. And now, and now it's expanded to the middle school and to the high school. So they, that we have one person that they hire as a mentor at the middle school, junior high and high school. So now kids fifth through 12th grade have an opportunity to be, to be in this uh, mentoring program. And they bring in different mentors, guest speakers, uh, other males, uh, male role models uh, to participate and do different activities that go on field trips. There's a myriad of different things. Uh, again, we have girls groups. We talked about that. We do have that in middle school, junior high and high school. It's very important for us to make sure that we're scaffolding that, which means that they build on each other. So we wanna make sure that those programs are building on each other. That's why we, it's so important that we have uh, services for our girls and our, and our boys groups. Let's see. And then one of the things we just started this year, she's not here today, but our uh, youth build. And I think, uh, 
Dr. Stickles talked about the Youth Build program. It's a great program. Uh, it's really serving those kids or really those adults that didn't get a degree. And so we're helping them with that through the Mo options, really getting their high set so that they can get their GED as well. So they'll, they'll learn a trade and then get their GED. I know she talked to you a little bit about that, but that's really ex something exciting that we're doing with CPC Mo uh, this year. So we're looking forward to see the successes of that. Care to Learn, but Care to Learn is our nonprofit organization. We serve students with any health, hunger, or hygiene needs. So I say this everywhere I go. If there's a kid in Cape Girardeau Public Schools, they should not be hungry because we have access continuously to food for them. Uh, we try our best to make sure that our parents and families know that, but anytime a kid says they're hungry or a family says, I don't know what we're going to do, we're on it and they have food before the end of the day. Um, if a student has a health concern and they don't have insurance, we can help with that. If they're not going to be able to pay for their medication, we can pay for that. If they need transportation to a doctor's appointment and someone to attend with them because their parent can attend, we can help with that. Um, and then hygiene products we do if they need laundry detergent, if kids are coming to school and their clothes are dirty every day. Let's don't first hotline. Let's say, what can we do to help? Let's call the family. Hey, what do you need? We've got laundry vouchers. We've got laundry detergent. How can we help you meet your basic needs so that when you come to school, you're ready to learn? Hey, can I just interject real quick? Yeah. So I was on the school board for over 10 years ago, and the sheer volume of things you guys are talking about that are new since I was on the school board is really staggering. And so I just wanted to Good job. I, so, I can't even imagine all the work that has, that has gone into all this. But, uh, that care to learn has yeah, doubled her. Well, and across the board, I mean, you're talking about safety protocols, preventive measures, sports, extracurriculars. I mean, so of part of our follow-up, our, our closing remarks are going to talk about the amount of resources that we have to direct to having safe school climates and, and hold greater, safer communities. However, once you ever put resources in one direction, those resources get pulled from other directions. And so we're going to talk about that here uh, as, as we close. So in no particular order, um, we kind of wanted to break down various different things. And these three silos you see before us would be what we consider uh, to be important from a school standpoint. So accountability. We feel that severity of punishment should fit the crime or the the poor choice restorative practices, as Mandy demonstrated and explained earlier, has to have that accountability piece coexisting with it. If you just take the restorative approach and not have the accountability piece, then it, it's not going to work, whatever. Cooperative completion of uh, juvenile risk and needs assessments. Uh, we'll dig into that here in just a little bit and exercise the reasons for uh, override section because as Kevin talked to us uh, at the last presentation with their form and that copy was given to everybody, there is a spot in there where the point system can be overridden. In our research and talking to multiple other juvenile circuits, it is used quite frequently when there is a, a concern for the greater safety of the community. Um, so that is one approach that we would like to have a further discussion on. Communication, and this is a difficult one to overcome, um, but transparency among all agencies, school to school. Many times we'll have some students transfer to us. We're dealing with a school from a neighboring state right now that does not want to share the discipline record of that student coming to us. And many times we, by law, uh, have to enroll that student within a certain time frame, but we may not have the full records sent to us yet. So we have to uh, address that agency to schools uh, many times multiple agencies that we work with we need to have improved communication and we have strived to build that communication but we still have a vast um, block that is in front of us where that communication is just not successful prompt reporting is another one when it comes to governance uh, possible city ordinances, but one of the things that has been discussed is an ordinance that the city could put forward. However, I don't see how a municipal code can trump a state constitutional right. So I'm not an attorney, don't pretend to be one, but that could be very difficult. 
We need to lobby the state for juvenile justice reform. There's various areas that uh, have been implemented and we are now seeing the fruits of that labor, but I would not call it uh, successes. Uh, I think there's some serious initiatives that need to be uh, looked at again, and those laws changed. We also have to have an authoritative body to govern school safety at the state level. Missouri is the only state in the country that does not have a legislatively designated entity that oversees school safety. So for our standpoint as Cape Public Schools, we feel this is the right thing to do, so we're gonna do this. We don't have to do it, we're not mandated to do it, but we choose to do it because we feel that the payoff is worth that investment. Missouri is the only state in the country that doesn't have that. So it's, it's very interesting to us. And uh, another governance uh, topic is restore state funding for the DYS program, which formerly known as ECHO. That shut down at the height of, of uh, COVID, uh, various reasons with state budgeting uh, that was taken away. That was also a support mechanism for the juvenile department. We had to recreate that internally because we still felt that there was a need that that had to uh, be there for the accountability part. Also the safety of our district as well too. If there were certain um, students enrolled with us, it would be a better fit for them to be in that program. So we had to recreate that ourselves. Uh, so again, uh, Mayor Kinder, when we're talking about, we do utilize a lot of resources, but yet once we funnel them in one direction, those resources have to come from somewhere else. Can you explain just a little bit about that last one? I'm not familiar with that. Echo? Yeah. So Echo was a classroom that was set up uh, for students that may be in the middle of their adjudication process, or it may be um, they were just not deemed through DYS to be able to attend a regular school setting. And so this alternative setting was set up. It was over in one of the state buildings over by Menards uh, for years and years, and uh, students would go over there. We provided, I think, one and a half uh, full-time employees to actually go over and support the educational process of those students, but they would also receive various other different uh, services as well when they were attending there. At times, it would also it would also serve as kind of a halfway point. So if a student was coming straight out of a juvenile lockup facility, uh, instead of just opening the doors, releasing the student, it would help transition that student back into a regular school setting as well to try to give them a better start to be more uh, successful in the school setting. So the state that. The state got rid of that whole program for Cape Girardeau. It still exists in Sykeston, it still exists in Columbia, it still exists in other areas of the state, but for Cape Girardeau, it no longer exists. Go ahead and ask your question. So is the alternative suspension? Is that what? No, that's it. So you're doing it all. You're, you're doing it. So we're, we're creating an alternative uh, placement for those students. Sometimes it's not even in our buildings. It could be right. on virtual learning. That's mm -hmm. right. So we've had to use some other resources to be able to do that. I'm just wondering what the it's a great question. Uh, but we, I think it is important to note that because we believe school safety is so important that we are providing these programs, but all of these programs have a cost. Homebound has a cost. Virtual education has a cost. Transition adds an additional cost. Positive pathways adds an additional cost. So all of those services, it seems, are getting pushed back on the school. Well, what can the school do? They're used. So school, you got it all. And we really are trying to carry it all. We really are. Um, and I think you can see that through the services that we provide. But the truth is, we can't do it alone. Um, I just want to go back to talk about, real quickly, if it's OK, Josh? Mm -hmm. Did you have another question you may, you may have? Oh, I have another question. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand what, just for Kate, just for Kate. There were other locations throughout the state that were shut down as well. But I was not, in, we as Cape Public Schools were not involved I'm in assuming the decision. issue from right. DYS. I don't know. They didn't serve just Cape Central, right? They served Jackson. And yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was not just, yes. it was just our Cape. division. And other divisions. Yes. Right. Yeah. So we lost the facility, the, the juvenile facility that we talked about, and we lost Echo at St. Um, no. That part no. So we lost the juvenile no. facility first. Mm -hmm. The detention facility, that was back in 2007. Yeah. And this was COVID. This was COVID. 
This was at the height of COVID. This is around uh, late 2020 when it shut down. Yes. The ECHO program shut down. One idea that we have, and this is just my own lack of knowledge. I did know about the point system, but I was less knowledgeable about the juvenile risks and needs assessment. And that was something that we were hoping maybe we could collaborate with juvenile on. Um, because when I read the questions, and maybe you guys do, I don't know, maybe you talked to somebody at the school, but when I read the questions on the risks and needs assessment, which is different from the points form, how do they, what are their interpersonal skills like? Um, how do they get along with uh, adults? How are they doing in school? You know, there's a bunch of questions on there. Do they have any leadership skills that we would be able to, like, we see them more than their parents see them. And so I think it's important, if it's possible, for us to be involved in those assessments to give our input, um, because what we have to share is a very big piece of what that student is doing in their life. It's just my opinion. I don't really know how it works. I just learned about it last week. I have a question. Lynn. I have a question, just like you just stated. For me, and I'm not, I don't want to be preaching to the choir, but those people that run around here and want us to vote for them when it's time for an election. Where do they stand on issues like this? You know, um, just like, well, you understand what I'm saying? You know, how, do they even know anything about ECHO? Do they even know anything about um, juvenile uh, justice reform? You know, and we talk about, um, I, I went to an event about two weeks ago and all of these people were running through there and they wanted us to vote and this is why you should vote for me and blah, 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 blah. But what do you know about our school district? What do you know about what's going on? You know, you want in there, but what, what are you going to do for us as a whole? You know? Um, and, 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 and we're starting to have those conversations, just so you know. I, 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 I've had conversations with Mr. Voss okay. in regards to that, but it's just at the very beginning. Mary of it and, and Mary yeah. and they're aware of it uh, there's other priorities too but this needs to probably jump to the priority for me exactly but again um, they have other priorities too that's your decision on the government's piece you know we've talked about this repeatedly so it's, it's beating a dead horse but you know children can carry weapons mm -hmm. it is not illegal for them to carry a weapon um, and so we are we are not about taking guns away from people um, we're not about kids not being able to hunt. That's all good. We just don't want kids carrying weapons in the city. And we don't think that's a big ask. And so, in our opinion, we would like to lobby the state to say, come on, guys, this just makes sense. Like, most other states have this as a requirement. We missed it. Let's get it back. Um, I think this kind of touches on a couple of things. But, um, yeah, you're doing so much, and, and people know very little about it. And when you're talking about trying to get change or money, um, making a case for the outcomes is really critical. And I would guess, and I, I don't want to make up statistics, so that's where my question is, that since implementing this, you've probably seen dropout rates go down. I mean, the, the, the research is, is I think every bit of reading really that. I mean, a lot of what they're recommending is what you're doing in your microcosm of your school setup. Um, you know, the restorative justice, the, the making sure you're accountable as well as you're getting supports to, to make better choices. And that the kids that are most, at, the kids that in the past were suspended because they're difficult to have in school were the kids that are going to be the ones that are going to be shooting. Yeah. Like, that's your risk. So if we can keep them engaged in school, like our whole community benefits from everything you're doing, and it may be a long-term, you know, these kids aren't 18 yet, and, and the violence increases as they, you know, as they, Older, well, it's about 25 years ago. But you know, um, so so do you have? Can you show that the recidivism? You know, the, the kids are staying so, longer. So we should we definitely have our graduation rates have increased. We can tell you that kids are staying in school longer. We can tell you that the high set, which is the old GED, um, we've got increased rates of completion on that. I mean, the cost savings on in all the other areas that we would pay in terms of social services, police, right. you, you know. It outweighs. That's why we. That's why we feel important. That it's important. You know, if yes, they're not, if someone else isn't going to do it, looks, we're going to have to do it. It's expensive, but it's my goodness, lives saved, not just potential you know, victims, but these kids. And simple things, and Miss Scheller can answer to this, not to put her 
out there, but I just did the yonder patch, the yonder pouch, for example, with cell phones. The data that we have from the high school on the drop in, you know, uh, fights or disruptions or whatnot is almost, Im it is measurable, but I want to say immeasurable because we have seen that swing to such a positive, um, thing. right, so such a, a positive day, environment. Then, right. Can you share that information between Lyle and the parents? Because I know I've been hearing from parents about how much they hate the, like they understand at the same time like yeah. they hate. Yeah, we will. We have to collect the data, enough data, so that we can actually show a, a considerable, yeah. a considerable improvement in the class. I think we have enough. We're going to kind of wait till the semester. High school. Yeah. There's no audience. <laughs> and you can't film. But I did want to go back and say something. So we're talking about in school, we're dealing with in school behaviors. So when we do restorative practices, we're restoring and consequencing based on what happens in school. We have no control over what happens in the community. So I want to say that all these things that we're doing are helping, but the truth of the matter is when you talked about recidivism, and I know we don't have the data on that in front of juvenile, but the truth of the matter is our kids are stealing cars. Our kids are occasionally shooting a weapon in the community. Our kids are uh, getting in cars and, and taking stuff out while carrying guns. And those same kids are the ones that when they turn 18, I'm seeing them come up. Because they did the same thing that they did when they were 15, that they didn't get in trouble for. This is not a big on juvenile, this is the law. I'm not digging on you. They're doing the same thing that they did when they were 15, but now it's not okay, and now I'm in trouble. That's a problem. So I have a daughter who's a senior at Cape Central, and so um, when she was a freshman, there were 325 kids in her grade, and now there's only 255. So where did those kids go? The 70, almost 75 kids. So we don't promote by, we only promote by credit. So some of them could be 10th grade. They, they don't all the list, so they say 10th grade, so that's the uh, class rank. Um, we have about 30 kids retained. And I don't want to blame that on COVID, but on COVID we also had a, a, a significant drop. And then some go drop. to uh, Central Academy, which is not that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a variety. So there's a variety of reasons why. But we haven't dropped that many kids. No. Yeah, that's right. Right. We haven't dropped that many kids. <laughs> no. Actually, our, kid, our student enrollment is, is going up or staying stable. We really haven't. A quick question back to the authoritative body at the state level. In other states, is that in their equivalent of DESE? No, not, not some states. Yes, some states it's running through their Department of Public Safety. Uh, Virginia runs it through the Virginia uh, Justice uh, System. So there is a designated uh, state level agency that is responsible, you know, to ensure schools do what they're supposed to be doing. And those states just figure out which department that just fits in with yeah. what their model of governance is. Yeah, keep it consistent from school to school. Right. right. Yeah, well, it seems maybe with a new governor coming in, it might be an opportunity, you know, for mm -hmm. them to look at their state. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, so as, as I spoke earlier, um, I'm a part of also CES, Center for Educational Safety, and through Missouri School Board Association, there's a lobbying arm there where those discussions have been taking place the last several years, continue. It's just not, you know, it hasn't percolated up to an extent yes. uh, to be important enough yet. I have a question. Um, how have the recent social media trends affected the culture of our, of our school? Immensely. Immensely. Um, you know, we had a recent incident uh, with our own district that uh, I shouldn't say incident, incidences. Um, so, First, let's kind of back up. There, there's a couple of things that the community needs to understand that's taking place there. It's two different silos. One, you have outside agents who are either outside of the country or in other locations in the country who are posting these media threats uh, wherever else within the United States. Um, and then basically, the goal is to create chaos for that school community, fear, chaos, apprehension, and attending, so on and so forth. And then the other silo is 
students are seeing this on social media because it is so prevalent. If you look at the algorithms of what teenagers see daily on their social media feeds, they're inundated with it. And so you will have local kids then seeing that, repeating that, and doing it to their own school community as well. And then we are constantly have to look at every threat that comes across. And so that's where the utilization of behavioral risk assessment teams are really important. So we need to go in and see, is there really a threat that is being posed and how we analyze that, how we quantify that, how we assess it, and then case manage that. However, if there is not other silos involved in a restorative approach, the legal accountability aspect, the school consequence accountability aspect, the risk assessment only goes so far. We can identify it, we can figure out where they're thinking, what type of psychosis they may be going through or what type of psychological mindset they have at that point, and we can figure that out. But if we don't have these other components to back that up, then we haven't truly created a, a safer environment. Stacy. I'll ask the, the same question I asked when uh, prosecuting attorney Welcome was here. And that is just to make sure um, I'm answering the public correctly. And this question is asked of, well, why don't we just kick those kids, those troublemakers, out of the school district? I'm pretty sure all that you've shown us <laughs> reveals the clear answer, but the answer is so do you the, we have to serve all kids right, right. Uh, yeah. the state requires us to serve all kids and we're not going to do that because we can do some restorative things and help them and support them in the buildings the students that we feel that are a danger we do yeah. they they don't come on our campus no. we have alternative way we still serve them but we just serve them in a different way and that's why we have all of these different options that we were talking to you about You'll see lots of different options for our kids. Well, some of those are used for some of those kids that are, uh, we don't feel are safe to be in our in our buildings. Like taking them out of school, puts them on the street. No. I know you already know. Uh, puts them on the street, creates more <laughs> drug use, violence, and everything in the community. So that that's not the answer. And, well, and, and, and the, the consequences in the legal or through MISHA um, are, are pretty well spelled out. And once once a, a child, you know, kind of experiences a, a structured consequence, they they have to be allowed you know, fully restored uh, education. I'm glad you mentioned Misha because that's an accountability piece as well. Because a lot of our kids that are that are in sports and athletics and band and all of these, we're all under that umbrella of Misha. So it helps keep our kids engaged in our schools. It goes back to all of these different engagement things that we have for our kids. The more we keep our kids engaged, the less likelihood they're going to get in trouble. And so that's why it's so important. But it also costs, there's, there's resources that have to be used. That's why we wrote the 21st Century Grant. That's why they gave us the $2.5 million so that we can actually help with some of those things as well. So. I, want to, I want to go back to something like you said, and you've been patiently raising your hand, and so has Mr. Kidd, so we'll grab everybody. Um, but what you said uh, about the social media posts is that we do take every one of those seriously. It takes a lot of staff time and energy to make sure that we are making the best um, decisions related to that. And we do, we involve the last one, the FBI was involved with, KPD was involved with. Um, our we, SROs. Our SROs, of course. Yes. Our, our administrators at yes. the high school. Yes, district personnel, superintendents. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you know, principals, all assistant right. principals. So we come together and we say, okay, it's this kid. And not that we want, we want kids to be restored. We don't want to make an example out of every kid, but we do have to have something with teeth to it because what happens is we've had some major threats and the kids don't have a major consequence outside mm -hmm. of school. And so why isn't the next person going to do it? because it disrupted school and got 400 of our kids to check out. I don't know that number to be true. I'll just throw a number out. No, it's it was a pretty accurate. It's pretty accurate. <laughs> um, my own yeah. kid was emailing me and I was like, you're fine. I know what's going on in your day. <laughs> so, um, but that, that's, that's the truth of the matter with what you said. And I know you have a question. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, talking about communication and knowing that there's a need for more communication I know you talked about a multidisciplinary team approach to the communication. How does that work? Like if a child has experienced 
violence in the home? Is that then communicated to the school? How how is that working? Or how it can depends. How it depends can on that the it it depends on the agency that we're working with. Um, there's a lack of information that's shared with us. If children's quite is involved, mm -hmm. I know pretty immediately. Um, most of the time, by the next day, uh, they all have my cell phone number too. So if it's something big, um, I'm going to know. I'm going to reach out to the administrator and the counselor, and I'm going to say, "Hey, handle this kid with care. Something happened. I don't have the details yet, but let's support them and surround them." That's where it starts. Then I get more information, then I feed it out to whoever uh, has the need to know, and we do wraparound services. So, so let's talk about safe school violations. Part of the issue is, 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 is Kevin talked about it at the last session. Is it's five days? They have up to five days to tell us. That's a problem, partly because the problem is is that that student could still continue to be in the building and we don't know anything about that for the five days. And it's also a problem from state to state. So there's a communication problem from state to state as well, just like Josh was saying, we've been trying to get records for this specific student from another state. Because the parent reported. The parent reported it, but we, but we have to know that it's a safe school violation before we say, no, you can't attend the school. So we have five days to enroll a student. So then that puts us in a bad situation of having to make a decision without having all the, the knowledge that we need to actually make a good placement for a student. Whether it's at the alternative school or whether it's virtual or whether whatever it is, we have to have that information come to us. So who and that's makes why that important. change? When when that when you look at, because see, I keep going over to the governance part of it. Somebody over has to go in and I don't want to use the word fight, but um, encourage or whatever to make those changes where those connections. Um, can be made like so part two different issues one is we don't have a good database that communicates between state to state am i saying that correctly kevin yes sir the so other who, issue who is over that okay that's what i'm saying who at the top who how do we make that that ladder where does that ladder go to up here that would make those changes who makes those changes i would think that would be federal because to mandate it state to state to communicate. It has to be a, a national database to be able to see those type of things. And I don't know if there's a, I don't think there's anything out there that does that. Am no, I you right? would have That's to. That's correct. It would yeah. have to be coming from the feds yeah. to be mandated for each state. You would have to look at the U.S. Department of Education yeah. basically it's making bigger, that a mandate. It's a bigger issue with that type of communication, especially from state to state. And I don't know if we can do that. I'm sorry if these are well. ridiculous questions. No, it's not. But I always know that some of these are always, just, they're not just state issues. I'm just trying to understand where the, yeah. where the communication breakdowns are. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to we, get some of that. It, we have communication breakdowns at the local level, regional level, state, and national. And okay. so when you put all of those together, yeah. So when yeah. You know, you've got a quagmire. Josh does this very well. One thing we're required to do, the second we have a threat of any kind, we report it to Courage to Report. <clears throat> That goes to Missouri database, so if our kid goes anywhere, they have access to it and we self-report. We are required to do that and we do it immediately. Um, so the second we know, that's done. So as a, as a trainer across the state and across the country with that model, the reason that we advocate for that is there have been times where a risk assessment is taking place on a student. The parents are like, nope, we don't appreciate this approach. We're done. I'm going to homebound the student or homeschool the student or we're going to move. The last thing we want is kids going to public schools is that kid drop off the radar and show up in Kansas City, show up in St. Louis, show up in Shelby County in Tennessee, show up wherever. And so we utilize our first report replaced the Missouri School Violence Anonymous tip line back in 2020, 2021. And so we utilize that platform to help disseminate information. And they have a network that they're trying to build with other states, uh, but here in Missouri, and it's operated under MIAC as well as Missouri State Highway Patrol, uh, they have the phone numbers of administrators, counselors, uh, SROs, and if there's an alert that comes through, that information easily gets shared. And so we log in, we look at it, uh, you can access it through your phone, so it's it's uh, user-friendly on that aspect. And we and, all have each other's numbers, like oh, yeah. DFS, juvenile, us, like we can reach each other Day, so that be an issue. But there is times where, just full transparency, 
we as the district don't know that something occurred and we don't get the call until it meets that four or five day limit. Right. And right. that is an issue that has to be right. fixed. Yeah. Mr. Kim, did you have a question? Um, <laughs> a couple of things, I think, but I think these are all good questions. First of all, I think we should hold our uh, elected officials accountable to answering questions. Mm -hmm. So don't give your vote away for free. Thank basically. you. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but um, it's something to consider. Uh, secondly, I, I think that um, one of the things that I, have, I thought that this committee will do is um, educate our community. And they've gotten a hell of an education through this amount of information that you've kind of forced by us here. Lots of amazing things going on at the schools um, to catch things early, not catch things when you're in jail or a, a disaster has occurred. Um, and I think, I hope that um, people take notice of that. I, one of the things that is interesting is that you don't see the guidance from your state DESE to require the level of um, activity that we're seeing with, with K public schools. And we need to figure out a way how we can um, maybe, you know, just are these best practices. You're, you're telling us a lot. So you seem like you're doing a lot. So to hit a pause on you right in. to hit a pause on you right there, there so there is a state statute that all Missouri schools must go through active intruder training annually with their staff. Okay, so there's a statute that, but it does not define what that looks like. It just says you need to take your staff through it annually. There are statutes that you must do a fire drill, tornado drill, earthquake drill, and an active intruder drill. They do not tell you how many you must do. They do not, those statutes also do not tell you to what depth. Do we need to take a roster? Do we need to take a roll? Do we need to go to an evacuation point? Do we need to, you know, all these various different things. There's no guidance on that. There is best practices that are recommended through various agencies, whether it be DESE or whether it be through CES. Uh, CES. Yeah, CES will, you know, we have best practices that we recommend to schools as well too. However, there's no accountability if districts are not doing that. And, and so, funding. and there is no funding. Yeah. So, but this leadership is taking some very aggressive steps forward and trying to figure it out financially through <laughs> grants, well written grants, trying to figure it out uh, within our own budget, um, which is very stressful. I'm certain of that. So, uh, I want to commend you for all for those things that you're doing. I think that's great. I got a couple of a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> One, uh, a lot of times I kind of I kind of uh, live by the 80-20 rule, okay? And I bet that just a few students are causing the major disruptions and major risk. I don't know if that's 20%. That's your statement is exactly I like I like the fact that you know the K public schools high school like me. I mean, I think my kids are there. It is a safe place to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably safer than any other school in this area, I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> My kids have all gone through and continuing to go through and we have a few yeah. that, 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 that cause problems, but are also worthy of us looking into being. We don't have to give up. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, so, um, in this area of gun violence task force and this and this uh, this bucket of a few kids i don't know what a few means but it might be a hundred in our school system i don't know but uh how are you zeroing in on those individuals because you, you know who they are right you know who they are and the second thing part of that is basically does external behavior i.e i'm not in school it's summer, it's spring break, it's Saturday. Does external behavior, if you're notified, ever flow through to this this uh, carrot and stick kind of thing? Did you read that book? 
No. There's a, book, a trauma book about hearing sick uh, trauma. It's very, it's like, really impressive. You know what that was. <laughs> um, so, do we provide, if we know, do we try to help that kid and provide wraparound services? Of course we do, if we know. We're trying to do whatever we can to support them. Can we discipline them or consequence them in the school? No. Well, so on a Saturday, and a kid's marching across, let's pick Jefferson School, with a gun shooting in the air, and we have video, we know who that kid is, right? Um, not that this ever happens, but what what hap what happened? Can that kid be captured once they come to school? I don't mean like captured. <laughs> can they be captured and say, you know, this is not appropriate behavior? And I mean, I guess there's some legal boundaries that you can't cross. But how how do you make how do you make if if, if juvenile can't? Do certain things. Well, first off, if a student, how do we weave that together to, to make yeah. sure that we are as a school-aged individual, if they're firing a weapon, if anybody fires a weapon within the city limits, that is an infraction. That, that's a crime. So it is. No one is allowed to fire a gun. I know but is, you're telling us that, but, but they do. It. They're still but showing they do it. They're, they yep. do it, and they show back up at school. Right. So, okay. so it, it depends on whether that student is in our care. If a student is in our care and we know that they've done that and we're notified by juvenile, we can have conversation. But if they are if it's outside of school, there's there's not a there's not the care that we can find whether they whether they're attending our school. So the kid that jumps the fence with the gun in the backpack going to the fair. He comes to school on Monday. That's where if that's we're notified. If we're notified. If we're notified. Okay. And we may not be notified. Okay, that's that middle part. That's that's the part where there is a breakdown of communication. We need to, we need to explore, uh, and it's not just juveniles. It's the police. It's it's there's a broader net there around how we can weave together this this communication. But, piece. but, but so, let's just say you're aware of that kid jumping the fence with a with a gun. But if we we're in gun violence task force. Here. What are you going to do on Monday morning? If they own the gun, first of all, it's not illegal. If their family owns the gun, it's not illegal. They're well, trying to get into a place, though, but where guns aren't for, if we are allowed, that, we would have They would have a conversation. Yeah, with we need to stop for a second, because the first thing is, <laughs> we're catching that kid at the door if we know about yeah. it. They're not going to class. They're not going to Let's just clear that up. We don't that's need to talk about it. We don't need to talk about services yeah. yet. We have to talk if about the immediate know. safety of the facility. That is very if, important to know. If we are aware, didn't go there. But we've also had to spend almost two hundred thousand dollars on weapons detection systems because we may not be informed. And we I'm may not saying that this individual is going to bring the gun to school. No, but they but have no. Obviously, the if we're aware of it, they're not going to get there. They there'll be someone there waiting for them, you know, making yeah. sure that someone has a conversation with them. If we know, because yeah, I'm know. going back to there's a few kids. Again, it's a hundred maybe. I don't know, but um, that are in these situations. Sometimes they find themselves there by mistake, but it's hard to change a mistake, especially when your friends are looking at you. Um, so we've got to be able to, again, gun violence and use, use, as I heard somebody say on some movie one time, is, is really, really bad. Yes. Well, I think we yeah. also, I, I love it's that you It's scary, scary to the community scary to the children that are going to school. Um, and so I want to know back to the governance, we're back to the communication, we're back to something. What can this task force do or recommend that weaves a, 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 a communication strategy around capturing these kids when they get when they get into problems and then they, they show up at school and not not three or four or five weeks later. So I, I, I can tell you one thing. So in 2008, the federal government changed the uh, parameters of FERPA. Okay, so if you're familiar with FERPA or not, basically that's the record keeping of a student that you're in charge of. Okay, but it is also used as a shield to protect juveniles uh, in allowing their personal information to just be thrown out and scattered in the wind. Uh, to allow them to go through whatever process they may be going through. So 
One of the things that came out in 2008, and people still don't realize this, is that if there is a direct correlation between the health and safety of the student and that greater school community, that information can immediately be shared to the educational facility. That is what we preach, that is what we teach, that is what we talk about through our risk assessment process. That doesn't happen. Does it that doesn't happen, happen, happen locally? Or I, it, no, it doesn't, not at all times. No, there so is not. It happens, but not. Frequently, it does not. Frequently, More it does often not. than it's your More often, it does not occur than it does occur. A lot of times, how we find this information out is through backdoor channels between our SROs and the police department because there was somebody working the street at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. They messaged either myself, uh, former Chief Blair, or uh, Chief Flick, or Scrog, uh, Officer Scrog is one of our SROs back there, and it's, hey, heads up. This is going to this is what happened, what's going on. So immediately we work with that administrator in that building saying, hey, this is what we heard. Or if that connection was made with the building principals, then they're notifying us at Central Office, hey, we've heard this has happened, we may need to look into this on Monday morning. So, so but there's gaps. Yeah. So the FERPA though huge is, gaps. is the schools are up, is the rules around who the school can share and what information. Do the police that the also justice. pertains to agencies as well. Because we have HIPAA, of course, for mental health and medical. For, so so it's even stricter, right? So your mental health, but it's but safety to self or others is always the, yeah. that's the caveat. Mm -hmm. right? and, and yeah, I've had to explain to a lot of people, no, you can tell me because yes. they need to know because safety is really what you're responsible for. So when it comes to that, that layer of safety, that actually goes out the window. Now, it is not a part of launch. I can share everything. It has way. to be to that instance and what is taking place and then how it will affect either the district or the agency. We're not gossip or what we're talking about. Absolutely yeah. correct. But the, the laws around um, juvenile records or um, illegal activity is different. It's not HIPAA or FERPA, right? So, you know, like the police can't release a name, like the newspaper can't release a name. So is that part of the law that's making it difficult for them to tell you? So ironically, you bring that up. Many states just a few weeks ago were releasing the names of the juveniles because they're fed up. And it is not a suable offense. It is not a criminally prosecutable offense. Um, you know, you look to the state of Florida, and multiple law enforcement agencies have said, and juvenile agencies as well, this is who did it. This is the one who disrupted your community. We're tired of it. It needs to stop now, and they're going to be prosecuted to the fullest. We had we had multiple <laughs> multiple surrounding agencies that came out and communicated a message that they're going to be held to the strictest level possible that they can be adjudicated through. Um, so the 35th Circuit, 33rd Circuit, they were all pushing out social media messages when those school threats were coming out through social media, basically informing kids, saying, hey, we're seeing this happen. If you think you do it, you can get away. We're holding you absolutely 100% accountable to the fullest extent of what we can hold you accountable to. Missouri, Missouri, Missouri Circuits Missouri. were doing that, yeah. Can't yeah, so we had placed calls out, I'd placed calls <laughs> out asking, what are you doing? Seeing them shared on Facebook, seeing them shared uh, at KBS 12. I never received and any contact from the school district at all. 33rd Circuit did receive contact and requests from uh, those schools requesting a statement. So a general statement was made by the 33rd Circuit. I wouldn't have any problem supporting the same statement that the 33rd made. It wasn't anything specific about any student or a particular instance. It was a general statement that was made. And unfortunately, Missouri is not Florida or any other state. In the, and that's what I talked about with my boundaries that the state requires our juvenile system to adhere to, um, which, as I stated, needs some reform, right. which led to the conversation about contacting your legislature. Is there an obstacle um, in, from your office in, in getting faster information to the school district? Um, at times, uh, we had that five days to contact the school district by statute um, of Safe Schools Act violations. Sometimes those violations are known to the public or the school district, but we might not have a report to act on that. Juvenile has to have a report to act on that and then to file that petition. So if we file that petition for a Safe Schools Act violation, like I talked about with murder, robbery, whatever, 
like that a safe schools act violation we have five business days to contact the school district superintendent we and i'm going to say we generally do that quickly the day of the day after a petition is filed but it might be days after the incident occurred well, does it ever get reduced when, yes. when you when you but you do you make that determination for the reduction or is it your if the investigation report does not, not meet uh legal sufficiency for the presented charge then yes my attorney reviews that every single time my attorney that again has 18 years of uh of experience with juvenile system will step for the uh, charge that meets the criteria in that investigation and many times we reach out to the investigating officer. That's what I was wondering. If, you, if, they, if they charge them with a safe school violation, does it ever get reduced on your end? Yes. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So if it means legal sufficiency for an assault third um, instead of uh, assault first, that's what my juvenile office attorney charges with and we present to the court. And it never gets uh, disputed. Is it different? Is the sufficiency? Different from the police standpoint, the juvenile standpoint, for assault third to assault first, that is, you drop that far. Um, that was just an example. Uh, well, but, just, but, but I, I mean, know this happens, so I'm just curious. I mean, law enforcement does a great job, but they're not attorneys either. So they might think that uh, an incident meets criteria for that first, but then legal sufficiency by statute, it might be a third. I mean, so KPD, can you speak to that? Like how many times do you present a case that you think is an assault in the first and it gets reduced on 18 years and up? Oh, it's not first. But the first. We have it where it all sure is common to the charges that apply and differently Yeah. And, but but for adults. Just for when, adults in general. Uh, yeah, when, I mean, other factors can play with adults, you know, prosecutors do lower charges sometimes, but a lot of that has to be too far. Uh, you know, and they may decide that, you know, maybe this charge and drinks and things works better in this case. So that's up to the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. A little more, it, just a completely different system. I think you're very happy for Okay, that's great. Okay. Thank you. So the, so the, the kid is riding around in, in a car. The guy gets pulled over. The guy throws the guy in the back seat. The kid's sitting there, right? Um, these are all things that happen. Mm -hmm. True? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All things that people become aware of, uh, sometimes instantaneously. Maybe it's an SRO uh, uh, police in integration. Maybe it's a, a juvenile reaching out with the information. But those things happen. That juvenile presents at school on Monday. I mean, they're not. They're, we don't have a juvenile detention system here. We don't do that very often. Um, they wouldn't go to an inpatient mental health facility. When it's not illegal for them to have the gun. So that's what Kevin said last time. Like, he's but not going to tell us every time he sees But it's a kids. scenario that's going to compound itself. So to a terrible, sure. terrible sure. We would like to be informed every time a student is. Let's just say exactly. you're informed. Okay, let's say you're informed. I understand we need to figure out how to get police, juvenile, schools working more frequently together. I get that. But let's just say now you're informed. You may have told us in all the slides before, but you're now informed. How are we going, to, how are we going to, to turn that scenario around so the next time that kid has an opportunity to get in the car with somebody he doesn't know, maybe they will make a different decision. Unfortunately, most of the time it's true. It's true, but we've got a real example here. Okay, so using your example, what would we do? What would we do if they if they know the person kind of, um, but not real well, and they're riding in the car with them, and, and the driver's a felon, and so they get pulled over, so they give it to the kid, right? Because the felon can't have the gun. Um, we're going to talk to that kid if we know about it. Usually, we do not know if a kid has a gun, but as, if, as long as it's not stolen, we are not notified unless the kids tell us through word of mouth. So most of the time, we do not know if a kid has a weapon in the community as long as it's not stolen or it wasn't discharged. Um, if we know, we're going to be talking with that kid. We're going to be providing wraparound services. We're going to try to put a positive male or female figure in their life, depending on who it is, who is their trusted adult, counseling. Whatever we can do to support that kid, we're going to do. 
want to stop maybe right there though. The first thing we're going to do is make sure that that kid is yes. not armed coming into the building. Correct. Okay, I don't want that step to be lost anywhere. I mean, Sorry, that's going to be. Yeah, yeah. we cannot yeah. do that if we don't. Know. Right. And so go, that goes back to what do we need? Missouri is one of the only states that allows children to carry weapons, whether they're with a parent or not. I mean, my 11-year-old daughter, there is not, it is not against the law for her to take a gun, stick it down in her pants, and carry it around Cape Girardeau. She can't walk into a school with it, but she can go in Walmart. Let me interrupt you. So you mentioned uh, advocacy, ad, advocacy groups and or, um, what's the right word for, lobbyists. Mm -hmm. There are groups that are doing that in the state of Missouri to help bolster some of this governance. From a school perspective, from a school standpoint. Who are they? Who are they? So one of the primary ones is uh, Missouri School Board Association and their subgroup, CES, Center for Educational Safety. Missouri School Board Association is funded by the governor? No. no. It is funded through public school districts in the state of Missouri. You join here. Which Missouri Missouri money comes from where? From us. From the governor. Because it's in the right. yeah. yes. Yeah, so, but it's, but it's Missouri School Board Association, and they have a lobbyist effort to address or try and address this. this. But on top of that, they also lobby for more funding for this. You know, test scores need to be here, teacher certification should but be But I want to know who's active in the gun violence component around schools and youth. And what they're so, I, so you have various law enforcement agencies, um, you know, there's sheriff's department lobbying, uh, you know, that lobby in Jeff City, police chief associations that lobby. There are various community groups that lobby against gun violence. There's various school uh, entities that lobby against school. I mean, so it's not just one silo that lobbies against gun we violence. We are constantly talking to our local representatives about this. And I will, I will, I'm going to not say who it was, but I talked to one in church on the second row pew, um, which I think is very important that we have this discussion in church, uh, who is a big gun supporter. And my family has guns. I grew up on a farm. We shot guns on the farm. We did not carry guns in city limits. And what I was told, and I see we have some NRA representatives in the back, but I was told that the NRA... It doesn't think that kids should be able to carry weapons around in city limits without an adult, without their parent with them. I'm, I'm told that, that that is not true, that you guys are not against that. Um, there is some other gun agency that I guess is, you know, taking away any rights is a bad thing when it comes to guns. But if we don't allow a child to drive until they're 16 because we don't think they're responsible enough, we don't allow them to vote until older than that. They can't buy a gun until older than that. Why are we letting kids carry weapons? They're not carrying them just to carry them because they're going to go shoot a rabbit in the woods for dinner with their pistol. That's not why they're carrying them. So we do need lobbyists. We need NRA. We need them to say, we love guns and we support guns, so we don't think kids should carry guns in the city. That's my soapbox. Oh, Sorry. Right. You mentioned lobbying the state about juvenile justice reform. Aside from what we've just been talking about, are there other reform issues, you, other things you'd like to see reform? That would help? I think the point system needs to be reformed revisited. and revisited. Um, they're basically ensuring from my standpoint, they're ensuring that their data doesn't show that certain infractions are as bad as what they are, because it's very easy to say, well, but we also have to go back because there is no data that they can pull from because of an antiquated system, apparently. But their data is not showing serious infractions, which I would tell you anecdotally, we track our own stuff that we see in the community. Our data is far different than what was presented to us in the last presentation. So that point system needs to change. Um, it needs to be lowered quite a bit so that more stringent services or accountability, a piece of accountability, can go in on these juveniles before it almost gets to the point that it has to be grand larceny and the use of a weapon before we're even looking at potentially having a detention situation. 
Does that answer that clearly? That helps. Yeah, I was just thinking about there's certain uh, mental health diagnoses where mm -hmm. you do a survey with the school, the parent, and the individual themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that there is also this would be one where at least the you know self-reporting is a good, but at least the school would be a good. We do our portion of that. We work with community counseling center who sends somebody to work with us on that too. We have trained staff. I'm just thinking about the juvenile justice of the oh, school oh, they, with their point system. With their point system. Having, the, having the risk. Is, yeah, the, the risk, risk assessment. But, but their risk assessment doesn't include it's surveying the school's no. input. And that no. would be a good addition to that point exactly. system is, you know, input from the what, school. Yeah, what, what's the score? Whether it's our school or a different school in the county, right. whoever. Right. How many incidences of whatever. Oh, okay. We were talking about the point system and the process of harassment. Kevin, if you don't mind my asking, just follow up on that. When uh, a juvenile um, is, say, apprehended by the KT and um, I guess calls the juvenile division, right, and speaks to someone, let's say over the weekend, whenever, um, and uh, that is automatically, their their points are already automatically examined. Is that correct? I mean, it may be that they have no record. Um, and we talk about, you know, at times, uh, the, the recommendation is, is to call the parents, have them picked up, you know, they don't enter any kind of further situation with the juvenile division. Uh, they don't, they don't go, yeah, they're not taken into juvenile or Yes, forgive me. You're good. Okay, so here's my question. Um, if that doesn't happen, if, if kids are just released to their parents in some kind of situation, are there ever any points accrued? Um, their history does follow them, but that might be for a status offense or for the first time possession of alcohol, let's say. Um, that stays on their juvenile history, and that does make a difference for future offenses. Sure. But at that point in time, it probably will score for a release to parent. Um, so that, we'll there's a record of that. We will then contact the parent that following business day or Monday morning if it's on a weekend, right. and we'll make contact and have our meeting, our intake with them, and then provide our services such as paid counseling, paid drug treatment, inpatient drug treatment, anything like that that we provide. I tried to go over last time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the JDTA, uh, the points sheet, um, as I stated, is from 2015. It's actually created in 13, implemented in 15. It is in committee, in review. Um, they came up with a, a suggestion to continue studying that, yeah. that, that uh, issue. So it is being looked at for revision, but it's just not being implemented. At this time. Well, I just mean, if, if, if a, a child is released to their parents after an incident, and there's never, you know, it doesn't, rise any situation where maybe the points are enough, you know, or, or what have you, does that, does that, are there ever any points attached to that situation, even if it doesn't? So, so, um, I, I, so the yes, next the time is scored at that point in time for that first uh, possession of alcohol. So those points for that situation don't carry over to the next situation. Uh, yeah, they're not cumulative points for the next possession of marijuana. And so they had three points here and three points there. That doesn't make six points total. Each instance is separately scored on that JTTA. But their prior history, if they have three or more uh, law violations, sub substan substantiated law violations, that scores additional points for that particular instance that they're being referred to. Yes. Our, our rest is a tremendous amount of law breaking until we finally have that. And so it's, it's being evaluated now. It's our risk needs um, some assessments. You have to do a lot to finally get to the Kevin, how long has that been, been um, evaluated? How long has it been in the evaluation process? In the committee now? Yeah. I think over a year. Right. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. Nothing moves quickly with the state. I'm the first to acknowledge that. I mean, uh, my juvenile detention uh, committee that I went and spoke to uh, two and a half months ago because I was so frustrated after calling 14 different detention centers in the state looking for a bed to lock up two kids that stole a vehicle that night, 
There's only 18 in Missouri, but I had to call 14 to get beds for these kids. Um, I sent a big letter to the state. They, they've been in committee for a year and a half now trying to assess the need for additional detention centers. But when I was up there, they were talking about the forms that juvenile detention centers utilize right now. So, so it's not matching. It's, it's, what you're there's requesting. frustrations across the board. Sure. It's not just blaming mm -hmm. one agency, Agreed. not communicating to yeah. another. I agree. Um, I think and the, you guys are on a, on a, you have a similar objectives because I think, I think the juvenile system is more restorative than it is, um, than it is uh, kind of justice-based. Mm -hmm. We're not punitive. Punitive, okay. there you go. Thanks for the word. So there, you, you have some, uh, inherent mindset that are very similar. I don't know if you have flexibility within your district to um, make uh, changes to operational changes, but I think one of the things that I'm hearing from the group here is that, is that um, I don't know how the two, three, I'm gonna include police here, so police, juvenile, and the schools, how they can have how, how a conversation, a recurring conversation about changing behaviors, maybe whether that's the communication side, whether that's the governance side, whether that's accountability, how, how uh, those, those conversations, I can see us as a committee making a recommendation on that. And if we did, how did that impact you? Like that? So how did that impact you? I mean, Josh, you're now responsible for meeting every two weeks for whoever you determine to meet, whoever you determine to meet, to start digging into these items. Is that unreasonable? So going back to one of the things that Kevin just said this, the juvenile circuits are no longer punitive. That's changed. So I think a deeper conversation needs to take place in the state of Missouri on shifting the juvenile circuits back to where there is a, an accountability piece because as we said, the recent, we know as schools restorative practices will work if you have the two silos that go with it, the restorative approach and the accountability. There is significantly lacking accountability with the juvenile circuit, significantly in our opinion. The state currently is in the mindset of trauma-informed, so they believe that uh, some as, of the some of the, the some of the some of the not some of the punitive aspects that um, have been utilized in the past, the state now deems as traumatic to youth in their mental development. Even detention is considered a traumatic event for our youth. So I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm telling you that's what we're bound to follow. But you have the discretion when you're evaluating a, a, a person that, or a child that comes into your care, you evaluate the level of uh, threat that they have. You have the discretion if you feel that. On that JDTA yes. that has been yes. mandated by the state and approved by the Supreme Court for us to follow. But you I have the discretion. Their, their guidance is um, they don't want us to override more than 15 percent of our referrals for the so but ethically morally so i don't do that other circuits might do that but they also other circuits will lock up status offenders for extended period of time we're not supposed to or allowed to do that and i can't do that because i don't have a detention center anyway so so i'm not going to go rogue and operate Cape County for Circuit 32, according to the Almighty Kevin Burnham. I'm not going to do that, or other circuits might do that. I can tell you that the high school, working with teenagers all day long, they know that. Yeah. They know that, they are not afraid of the crime because they know they're going to be happy and going to have a juvenile. I just thought that is the conversation in my building with not every kid, because not every kid wants to be a crime, right? But the conversation is, it doesn't matter. Well, I hate to hear that nothing's going to happen because I now have a higher DYS commitment, Division of Youth Service, DYS commitment rate for 2024 than what's been committed to the Division of Youth Services since prior to 28, <clears throat> excuse me, 2018. So there's so many kids, and every single one that has a gun offense that we have a petition for has gone to DYS. 
We haven't had a stolen uh, car or a gun offense for um, in the city of K for a month, month and a half, something like that now. So there is, we are making a difference. So that, that is good, but I'm, I'm just saying what the like mm-hmm. word I'll say here. Yeah, and that's true. That's and I, I hear that from other agencies. Right. Juvenile doesn't do anything, but that's just ignorance so, of what we're yeah, doing because we're not like, able to report. And we to know, the we know. I, I want to stop yeah. that appears us against you because that's not what's happening. We, it feels that way. We agree that we, when we communicate with each other, we do a good job when we're in communication. We agree that you provide restorative practices. Um, where we differ is the accountability piece. You're, you're feeling, uh, you're following the statutes as you read them, and, and we understand that. So the kids do say that. That's just facts. We can't change that. You can't change that. That's just how they feel. Um, so bringing this back full circle, um, one of the things that I think we could do on this needs assessment piece is the things that it asks about are behavior problems, no significant, moderate, or severe. We're going to be able to answer that. Attitude, motivated to change, generatively uncooperative, negative. We're going to be able to answer that because we see that every day. Interpersonal skills, we're going to be able to answer that. Peer relations, we're going to be able to answer that. Um, history of child abuse and neglect, you can look up, but that's what's not reported. Usually, they tell our counselors about, so we're going to be able to respond to that. Um, mental health disorders you can access, substance abuse you may or may not know about because it depends on you know what, what, whether or not they got into services or not. Um, school attendance and disciplinary issues, obviously that comes straight from us. Academic performance, that comes straight from us. Do they have um, an IEP in any area, individualized education plan? Um, that comes from us. And, um, you know, healthcare, what, what type of... Um, access to that. A lot of these things, the parental management style, like we've worked with a lot of these parents for 12 years. We know how they manage kids. Not how they tell you they manage. We know how they manage. Um, so, so when I look through this and what their social support system is, a lot of that is information that we can be helpful with. So that's what I want to offer to, to juvenile is our help. Not, not, we don't take anything. We don't we just want to help and be a part of the process to say, hey, these are the things that we know about this kid that we really think can help you as you make decisions. May I also, on that risk needs, every single case that goes to court, my DJOs are reaching out to the school that that juvenile I would attends. disagree with you. They, for the answers to the question that are relevant to the school, we also get the information from a parent or even sometimes if there is a minister and they bring that minister in that wants to self-report uh, information, we gather information from various sources to complete that risk of needs okay. assessment for the court report. Okay. I just want to offer our support in that because when I was, that's the first time I had seen those. I've always seen the point system. But yeah, I you won't see that. Yeah. I, but, I, want, I want to go back. I want to go back to how can we put up a structure? That, that allows, that's not here with all of the noise, right? But that can actually sit down and find ways to expand each silo of knowledge to one silo where, where legally possible, one silo of knowledge, which is way more powerful. Agreed. Um, and that agency to school and school to agency is what I'm speaking of right now. And I think we need to find a way, find a way through that 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 maze to where we can promote that. And um, we don't have the answer today, but I do. What I do hear is um, those that information, that data, that knowledge is extremely important on figuring out how to keep our youth on a better track. Keep us safe, keep them safe, and, and to, to, to um, enhance them as human beings yeah. and keep them out of prison and, I mean, a number of things. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, we're, we're willing right to have further yeah. conversations. One, one person, I mean, a gun incident, I said this many times, is on a razor's edge. It can either go better or go violently worse. It's a razor's edge. And information, 
data and cooperation will help a long way with that. Sure. Thank you. That's a good wrap-up. Unless somebody else has. I don't right. we, have, we have 10 minutes left out of the two hours. We were only supposed to present. Sorry. <laughs> what else does this cover for the group? This is what we wanted to do. Do so. uh, you have anything to say? That's hard to follow. So, okay. <laughs> no, I, I'm good. I'm all about communication. We did allow the SRO to have access to our computer records. So every day they're getting a summary of all the events that they can work with so that they can look at that. So, yeah, in this we don't know about something. I would say the communication between KKR Public Schools and KKR Police Department really doesn't lack there. there there's, there's always going to be outlier incidences of, uh, you know, because we're, we're human beings. Yeah. And so human beings can make errors, right? However, I, I don't feel that there's a large communication gap. I don't want to imply that there is any anywhere, but I know sure. better can be better. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. SRO uh, officer, what's your name? Sorry. 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 Sorry.
It's our representative. That's why he's going back to. What is that? It's Missouri legislature. No, it's our Missouri Department of Safety. Is it our my head agency is the Office of State Courts Administration. Division of Youth Services is under the Division of Social Services umbrella. Missouri is the last state in the union to have a separate juvenile department. That's part of that juvenile reform that I talked about, too. Okay. Yeah. There's well, problems with it. I acknowledge it. Yeah, so, you know, some of this, some of these things we're discussing are, are going to end up just being this big pot of, okay, how, how can we just at least raise awareness of what the situation is? Um, that's that may be always just the first step in many of these, in many of these things. So, um, you know, I think we've we've all heard some things tonight and, and at the juvenile uh, presentation that probably most of us did not know and are rather shocked to hear. And I think the community will be too. As, I, as I've had discussions, you know, about some of these, a few of these things uh, out in the community, people are shocked. I don't think most people even realize that that youth can carry. Uh, guns openly in the city. Uh, yeah, I think I think you know we're talking about you know, we're talking about youth here tonight in the last yeah, specific the community. If you go back to when just when the uh, when, uh, when we had some uh, criminal justice folks here talking about you know uh, you you go in and you get finally six months you get a sentence and you're out in nine months. I mean that's part of reform, not juvenile, but it's the, the criminal justice reform. And I think that. Instead of being out in six months, or at least a minimum of three years that you serve, I mean, some of them, yes, those are things that, yeah, we can't change locally, but we can certainly raise awareness. And I think that we can, in this particular instance, formulate working groups that can speak to each other more directly and more frequently around how do we work better together. And well, that might be something that comes out that of this. That can come out of this as a field, yeah. Right. And I, Something I just wanted to add, um, you know, you, you brought up that the fair was a place where you could not bring weapons into, right? Um, you know, growing up, I went to the fair. There were no um, fences. There, there was nothing, right? Like, I wasn't concerned. Uh, my parents let me run around with my friends. It was not a big deal. Because I work for the school district, I know a lot of things that most parents may not know. Not because they're happening in our schools. I'll be clear about that. But I know what's happening in the community. When I take my own children out to a community event, I am nervous. Because what I'm thinking about in that community event is not how many adults are carrying weapons, although that's, you know, but how many children whose brains are not fully developed, thank you, who respond in fight or flight mode because that's where they're at developmentally in their brain, are in this setting that could have them. And what thing is going to trip one of them off enough to either brandish it, which could cause mass chaos for people getting run over, or actually shoot a gun? That's what I'm thinking about when I'm in my community where I grew up. For what it's worth, again, at the fair, that was stolen out of the car there. Yes. And I, and I felt good about the fair. The gun the fair, it's stolen out of the car. Yes. <laughs> And I, and I did feel good about the fair, to be honest, because there was literally security everywhere. But when I went to the little the little one at the mall, <laughs> in the mall. Yeah, so again, the fair is such a safe fair we've had ever since I've worked. Agreed. There's only one arrest, and I'm going great. I agree. Well, I've heard reports that there were about 30 something guns identified, and some people turned away because of it. A lot of people turned away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's the best that happened, those. Good weapons test. Sorry. Can, 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 the, can the city expand? That's 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 state. I mean, there are certain organizations that are allowed to declare that for themselves. Right. Okay. So, so I mean, business, even businesses, um, so the fair, churches, fair. schools. Yes. Uh, I remember that now. I, I don't, it's, it's, it's I don't know that the city. Well, we can regulate activities in parks, uh, but it's yeah. uh, but it's for man-made areas. And now private businesses can do whatever. Side of the so, that so, so parks that we can regulate activities in parks, okay. and, uh, and we can discuss in the city. So, 
I, I think you know the fairs and special events can also regulate activities during special events like that. Which was done very well. Thank you. Yeah, and right, we're looking at ways to improve that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which was done very well. Thank you. Yeah, and right, we're looking at ways to improve. Uh, but all in all, it was a safe fair, uh, but it's like like that. The gap is only one person. Right. So all that extra security doesn't matter. Somebody can still get inside with the guns. Okay. So, but we can we can mandate certain areas around town as no gun zones, but people are going to break the law. Yeah. People are going to break the law. True, but if it's the only seat, if a kid is walking in front of a gun, he's going to have to pay the price. Yeah. 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 Yeah.